All right, thank you everyone for attending my informal Zoom meeting today. For those of you that are new, because I, I do see some new faces, this basically just started in response to me seeing a lot of information floating around on Facebook that was not correct information regarding the science behind COVID-19. So my background, I do medical research now at Harvard University. I received my doctorate degree in biomedical engineering doing bone research at Columbia University in New York City. And I've had a science background throughout my whole education. So I do this on a daily basis, it's my thing. Um, so I felt the need to kind of help correct some of that misinformation because it has been affecting people, a lot of people negatively in today's climate. And uh, that has actually then spurred some discussions about racism as well. Um, and then just how basically racism is essentially a public health crisis in our community today. So the topic for today is going to be racial disparities, specifically in healthcare and how we get um, the care delivered to people of color, but also how our society is structured in ways that susceptible them to more health problems. So just a quick overview for today's talk. I am gonna quickly, very, very quickly, because um, I get a lot of questions about this, just kind of cover what academic papers are and how I read them versus how you can also start reading them or use them to your advantage without having to go through all the training that I've had to go through. Then um, also I'm going to go through a couple of published research articles that highlight racial disparities that are present in our healthcare system how environmental stressors harm our health in general. This isn't just for people of color, but because they are subjected to more environmental stressors, it does hurt them more. But also about um, food deserts, that I think this is a concept that is very, very problematic at a lot of different levels in terms of healthcare for people of color. So I think, uh, and, and it's something that I don't think a lot of people actually know about. So I wanted to cover that today. Also, we're gonna highlight a couple of stories how I've come to learn about racial disparities and medical response teams treatment because of my obsession with true crime, which um, we kind of talked about at the, the last meeting. And then also something I think that is undercovered, which is the predicament of the black athlete. So this is more, um, I do propose some research in the predicament of the black athlete, but that is gonna be predominantly more of like my opinion as someone who's watched a lot of sports and had a family member go through some um, higher level sports. So the first thing is, um, I've seen a lot of people share articles and we've talked about in previous meetings how just articles that are written by reporters that don't necessarily have a scientific background, they can accidentally misconstrue information. So if when you can, it is really important to go and find a publication. And by a publication in an academic journal, I mean something that has been peer reviewed. So essentially, when you go to submit a piece of research that you've conducted at a research university with funding, that gets submit to a journal that you have selected based on if the journal fits your topic and also the reach of that journal. And it's peer reviewed in a process by other people conducting similar research to what you're doing. Essentially those reviewers look at your manuscript, they give feedback and like the manuscript is never just fully accepted. Um, in times of crisis, Jared at one of our previous talks mentioned how some of those papers sometimes will get pushed quicker so that information can get out to the public. But for the most part, anyone who's had to submit an academic paper knows how long that process takes because the reviewers do give a lot of criticism. Then you have to respond to those criticisms. And then ultimately the reviewers have to um, say whether or not they accept your response. And then also the editor has to accept it. So there is a very long process that is put in place to provide more rigorous results. And so that manuscript that you submit, it should contain an introduction, which gives all of the background information the reader needs to understand what's going on. There should be an objective, which is the goal of the study, a hypothesis, which is the research group's guess based on collecting um, known information. So basically when they were writing the background information, they've been reading all of this literature and information that's been known and then making an educated guess based on that. For the materials and methods, it basically just explains how the experiment was conducted, results self-explanatory. And then you typically have a discussion or conclusion section where the authors can then provide limitations of the study and explain what the results of their research means in the big picture of everything. 
So either, you know, what that means for us as people, um, just, you know, commoners trying to get healthcare, or if it fits in a bigger picture of other academic literature. And then there should always be sources and citations. If a paper is missing any of these components or they're unclear, you should be very skeptical in terms of the legitimacy of this being a peer reviewed published paper. So um, this is how someone like who is a researcher and is looking at a lot of academic papers all the time. We're constantly reading papers to keep up to date on research that could be similar to projects we're working on. You learn new techniques. You can also learn about new people to collaborate with on research. And so when I look at a paper, some of the first things that stick out to me that might not stick out to someone who's not in this field is how good the journal is and the corresponding author's credibility. And by that, I mean the last author or the first author on the paper, and I'll explain that in a second. Also the quality and reputation of the university or program. And so like something like Harvard in general, people usually hold that as having a high reputation and good quality research, but there are smaller universities that have really excellent programs that are, are diversified or specified in, in one particular avenue. Then I read everything with a critical eye. I don't just assume that it's correct or been done properly. And then I also pay attention to what literature is cited in that. So this is something that requires a lot of training and time. It's something I'm still working on, even though I've been doing it for years. And, and not every researcher, honestly, is very uh, is always super good at it. It's a, it's a learning process that you always have to keep building up those skills. So for people who don't um, aren't doing academic research or don't work for a university where they pay for these subscriptions to these academic papers. I know a lot of times people are like, well, I don't think I can access academic papers. So that's why I read like a New York Times article um, to get my information. But I think a lot of people don't understand that if you go to PubMed or Google, or Google Scholar, um, our government provides funding for a lot of medical research that in exchange for researchers using that funding to conduct their research, after a certain amount of time, these papers have to become available to the public. And so it's basically your tax dollars are going to fund my research. So in exchange, you're getting the information that I'm providing. So a lot of times the turnaround for some of these articles, depending on the journal, they are free access right away. Or um, you might have to wait a little bit, but ultimately you can find out through PubMed or Google Scholar if you can get free access. Also, you can find the authors on the paper and go to ResearchGate. You can send them a message, and a lot of times they'll send you the full text. Another avenue, uh, and I've done this a lot for people, you can actually just email me and I'll send you the full paper because I have access to everything. Uh, and one thing too, be ready to Google terms you don't understand. Just because a paper has big words does not mean you can't understand it. I have to Google things all the time. And also practicing. It just, they are quite dry. It's not like people write or read these for fun. So it's just something you have to get used to. And especially the part where you're reading everything with a critical eye just comes with a lot of experience and practice doing this. So with all these, I wanted to present all of this with these things in mind. So when I'm going over these research articles, you get an idea of what I'm looking for, why I think these articles are good, and why I'm sharing this information with you. So here's an example of me going to PubMed and typing in a topic that I'm interested in. And this is a paper that just came out literally like a week ago. Um, and uh, so for example, this one, because it was just published for, all, for most of you, you would actually have to pay money to access it. But for me, I can type this into my Harvard library access and I can just download the PDF right away without any problems. And so this is um, a person that you would probably look for on ResearchGate to ask for the full text of the paper. And also you would look at um, the fact that it's from um, this person, you can look up their research lab and see kind of what their credibility is as well as their um, university. And then you can also look up the credibility of this particular journal, which this one actually has, is, is quite credible. So these are things that I would look at right away. And this is also why this is an article I picked to share with you guys. So let's break down that particular article. Essentially the question from this article, they wanted to look at do doctors take better care of infants of their own race? Or is there any sort of racial disparity if you have um, 
a black infant versus a white infant versus a black physician and a white physician. And so I thought this was a nice summary they had at the beginning that concludes all of the, so the, this is your introduction. A large body of work highlights disparities in survival rates across, across black and white newborns during childbirth. So this was um, just, you know, to give me the reader some information. And then their hypothesis is that these differences may be ameliorated by racial concordance between the physician and newborn patient. So basically, they think if you can match the race of the physician and the baby, there might be some uh, lower birth, birth uh, sorry, not birth rates, but infant mortality rates. So then they give a brief summary of their results and then just a quick conclusion about that. So we're gonna break it down more specifically. And just so you know, the method by which they conducted this, they didn't actually have to do any particular testing in a hospital because there was a lot of data available from Florida's Agency for Healthcare Administration for um, a large range of dates. So they were able to pull all of that information and look at patient race versus physician race and whether the inf how long the infant survived. And so they identified the patients by race and removed patients if this wasn't clear. But interestingly, they had to conduct image searches of the physicians online to determine race. And that does end up being one of their limitations, which we'll go over later. Oops. So this is an example of the results they provide. The tables are very intense. So I just decided to show you one particular table and break down some of that to explain what they ended up doing. And then I'll just summarize the rest of the results on the next page. But essentially what they did is they created this model where they could shift different variables to account for um, different factors that go into the patient care and the birthing process. So you'll look here, um, they actually, so all of these yeses basically explain if they uh, fixed the model so that insurance wasn't a factor because we do know that there are insurance differences between race, um, oftentimes for patient, patients with race. Typically, um, black patients have uh, insurance plans that aren't as good as um, white patients, and we'll go into that later. Comorbidity refers to basically how severe the, um, the baby might have had a pre-existing health condition ahead of time. Um, also for the hospital, because hospitals can vary a lot in terms of their ability to care for patients and the, the quality of the care they provide. And then also they can um, look at just the physician themselves and look at how they, their treatment was for infants that were white versus infants that were black. So all of these columns basically correspond to changes um, between white and black infant death rates uh, or uh, numbers, I should say, percentages based on uh, getting rid of these different variables that could affect it. So the further down the columns you get, the more variables have been accounted for. So the first report that I think is important to go over is in this column number four. And so this number here basically tells you that the black infant mortality rate was 430 infants who died out of 100,000 births more than white infants. So this shows that if you had say maybe 100 white infants passed away, then 530 black infants passed away given the same conditions, the same variables that were fixed. So this shows that the black infant mortality rate is much higher than the white infant mortality rate. However, they then showed that this decreases by 257 over 100,000 births when the physician is black. So that's what this number is right here. So that's physician black with patient black. And so that's a 58% decrease in, infant more, in black infant mortality rate if the physician is black. So they didn't notice any changes um, with race for white infants, but this is a very striking difference if the race is matched with an infant that is black. And then also in column six, so they were able to fix for the physician specific. So within each physician, they saw a 39% decrease in the infant mortality rate if the physician is black taking care of a black infant versus a um, white doctor taking care of a black infant. So overall, we'll just go kind of, they do this, um, they have a couple more tables and some plots 
where they adjusted some other variables and were able to look at a couple of other factors, but I'm not going to go through all of those tables because they're pretty intense. So just to summarize the results of the rest of the paper, no matter what variables they adjusted, black infant mortality rate was lower if the physician was black, and this was attributed to white doctors underperforming. So they basically also looked at the number of black infants versus white infants per hospital. They also looked at the number of patients black doctors and white doctors might have had. So looking at all, fixing for all of these different variables that could potentially explain why a physician, a black physician might be taking better care of a baby. They found that because there was no difference between the care a white versus a black baby received when the doctor was black, that it had to be attributed to white doctors underperforming when it comes to taking care of black infants. Also, they noticed that physician performance did not improve by treating more black babies. So they didn't think it was necessarily that white doctors just needed more training in order to be able to care better for these infants. And also they found that the survival rate improved if the doctor received a pediatric certification. So this is regardless of race for the, for the physician. And also the survival of the mother did not vary with physician race, which they found to be very interesting. Because um, one thing they noted in the beginning of the paper is that it was uh, studying infant mortality was uh, favorable versus studying mother fatality. Because with the mother, you have um, a lot of choice and communication issues between the physician and the mother. But when it comes to the baby, you just have strict care because there's never any communication between the infant and the doctor. So they thought focusing on infants um, got rid of all of those extra variables that could confuse the results. But it's interesting that the survival of the mother did not vary with physician race. In their discussion and conclusion sections, they basically emphasized because of their results that the workforce must be diversified and policy action is required to optimally care for newborns because this is a prevalent thing between hospitals. Also that they think hospitals should invest in exploring their role in institutional racism because this is a very distinct example of how there's clearly something going on um, that's allowing for these racial disparities to occur. The limitations section I think was quite excellent considering uh, sometimes papers, especially ones that are more based on, um, instead of looking at patient data that are more focused on like an experiment using mice or animals or more basic science methods, they don't always like to go into the limitations section, but I think this one was particularly excellent because they mentioned a lot of limitations and that they were unable to identify the specific mechanisms. And by that, they mean they don't know if it had to do with communication between the mother and the physician, or if it had to do with the physician training or physician predisposed um, preferences for working with black versus white patients. Uh, also, I think one thing that's very important, if you know anyone who works on um, delivery and care teams, having a patient, their patient care team is also extremely important for the health of that mother. It's not like the physician is doing everything. So with this study, they were only able to look at physician versus infant, and they couldn't look at the entire care team. It also doesn't account for home births, but um, in the paper, they said only about one and a half percent of births in the state of Florida are home births. So it's a very small percentage anyway. And they also can't separate socioeconomic status from race, which Moving forward, we'll see how these two things are very intertwined and how a lot of times it can be difficult to, to see if one thing is happening because of the other thing or vice versa. And then also they had to rule out a lot of physician data because they were only able to find pictures for about 8,000 out of 10,000 physicians. And I would imagine too, they didn't mention this in the paper, but um, you can't always tell by a picture someone's specific race. I think that's maybe why they focused on white versus black because that is a little bit more stark. But yeah, that's a, an obvious limitation. So this is another study that I found, I thought was very interesting, titled Racial Bias and Pain Assessment and Treatment Recommendations. And this is the more interesting aspect to me, false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. So this was, um, you look at the table here, this group right here is just 
standard white people in general, just the public. But this column here is white medical students and residents. And essentially they were polled on all of these different um, questions, their criteria, and essentially their biological beliefs about differences between black and white people. So the ones that have an asterisk are ones that are true. So those are facts. And the ones in bold font are misleading, incorrect facts. So you can see here, um, blacks age more slowly than whites. Your standard layperson, 23% of them thought this was true. And then it's kind of scary because you look at the first and second year medical students and they kind of align with that as well. And it does seem to go down a little bit between your third years and then your residents. So these are people who have completed medical school and are actively practicing in the clinics um, to receive further training to really learn how to take care of people. Um, this one was good. Whites have larger brains than blacks. Unfortunately, 12% of the just standard population thought that, but this goes down to zero with, with more medical training. Um, this one I think is particularly troubling because it does affect a lot of um, the things we're going to look at later in terms of white physicians uh, assuming that black patients have a higher pain tolerance or that they respond differently to treatment. So black skin is thicker than whites. Almost 60% of just your common people thought this and then 40% in the first couple of years of training. And then it goes down to 25%, but still that's a quarter of your practicing residents in hospitals who are, are falling for these, these false beliefs or harbor these false beliefs. So I thought um, those were particularly interesting. And then there are some, this one I think is kind of like that athlete uh, predisposition. Blacks are better at detecting movements than whites. And I mean, it's, it's crazy. Some of these are still pretty high for a physician who's taking care of you. And so some of the other, just to summarize some of the other results from that, uh, white medical students that harbored these false beliefs they, they took all of those survey responses and then also looked at some of um, the other answers they had provided. They also demonstrated racial bias in terms of pain perception. And specifically, they felt that um, black patients had a lower pain tolerance than white patients. And then because this pain perception was inaccurate, it led to incorrect or inaccurate treatments. So they weren't dealing with the pain levels appropriately. And so um, where they might've given treatment to a white patient, they wouldn't give that same treatment to a black patient because they believe they perceived pain differently. So interestingly, among the white medical students that did not harbor these false beliefs, so if they answered the questions correctly, they typically thought that white patients had less pain, which is the opposite. So um, they, they either believed this for two different reasons, as speculated in the article. They thought either that black patients tend to have higher pain levels because that is something that research has demonstrated that oftentimes black patients do have a higher pain tolerance on average. Doesn't mean it's the same for everyone individually. But also they noticed this trend in some medical students who are kind of catching on to these tests um, and these surveys that sometimes these white medical students will provide answers that they think the, the survey is looking for because they wanna compensate for these known racial disparities and they don't wanna look racist, frankly. So those were two possible reasons for why they, they thought these, the uh, narrative got switched. So here's some other papers I also read um, that I'm gonna highlight some of the results of. I read a lot more too, and honestly, if um, there's a great reading list that someone was give, that someone sent to me that I'm happy to share with anyone. It provides all of these academic articles as well as non-academic journal articles written by journalists and reporters that summarize a lot of the results from these. And I wanted to highlight too, these are, these are screenshots I took also from the PubMed website. And so like, here's an example, this is a free article for anyone. And so also right here, free and free. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that all of you can read these articles too. It doesn't have to just be coming from someone who works in an academic setting. So summary of a lot of these um, 
conclusions that came from these papers. We're not going to spend as much time breaking them down like I did the other one, but BIPOC, uh, so Black Indigenous people of color, on average have worse hospitals because of the location they live in. They tend to be lower quality hospitals or the patient turnaround is lower, but also they have um, worse health care coverage too. And a lot of that has to, it ties to the socioeconomic status and geographical location. And black women are three to four times more likely to die from a pregnancy related death compared to white women, but they advocated that this can be resolved by better care before, during, and after birth. But this also means that this has to be a woman who can take time off from work to make these appointments, who can afford the copay for these appointments, and also has the resources after birth um, to take care of these children. Also, um, one thing I really, really want to highlight that a lot of these papers, to almost all of them talk about, is that these racial disparities and bias vary greatly with location and often are, are product of the geographical location. And I thought this quote from this particular paper was especially telling. This is actually a report that was published. So this is from the National Institute of Health. They often do these panels and they'll report, um, they have a lot of re like top researchers come together every once in a while who are specializing on these different topics and they'll have them sit down together and write a report summarizing all of the, the knowledge that people have right now. And this is an example of that. And the, this quote from it says, reducing geographic disparities in quality of care will benefit all Americans but is likely to yield greater benefits to minority patients. So this means like, even with states deciding if they are going to accept Medicaid, all these different things allowing for, you know, the, um, even the uh, cost of living, it's just the economic benefits. A lot of these things have to do with how great the hospital systems are in that area and if they're able to properly care for their patients. Um, one paper also discussed whether civil rights laws and policy implementation can be the way to really resolve these health inequalities, but ultimately they found that they're limited and that the focus should be on enhancing the quality of provider care in hospitals that service a high volume of minority patients. So basically trying to recruit higher quality doctors to those areas. Um, and then also potentially policy changes within the specific hospitals. Also, healthcare providers do exhibit implicit bias against BIPOC patients. And by implicit bias, we mean not necessarily overt racism, but um, unconscious assumptions they make, like in the study we, we previously talked about, unconscious assumptions they make that ultimately lead towards bias or unintentional discrimination against minority patients. And then this ultimately affects their care strategies. And one thing, to, uh, they, a lot of these papers also mentioned a lot is we need more research on true and perceived racial differences in health and healthcare. Because there are some genetic, you know, genetically based differences between um, different ethnicities and races but that, that, those things need to be identified and they need to be communicated better to our actual medical students and residents. So this is a podcast. I know some people are more auditory learners than visual learners, and I thought this one was particularly excellent. So NPR does these shortwave podcasts, and like, for example, this one's only 15 minutes long. I really like them when I'm walking to work because it's just a nice short listen. And so um, this was an interview about how coronavirus and racism are dual public health emergencies. So this was an interview with David R. Williams, who's actually at the Harvard School of Public Health. That building is just right next to mine, and they do really fantastic work. I know a lot of people who do research there, and it's just, it's a great program, and they have great teachers and, and everything. So um, this is a paper he'd written, I think, yeah, looks like 2018, so just the end of 2018 on how stress in the mental health of populations of color um, and how advancing our understanding of race-related stressors can help tweak the way we deliver healthcare to particular areas and people, uh, groups who are uh, really stressed out and have a lot of these environmental stressors. So I just wanted to highlight two quotes from it that I think are really excellent because he talked a lot about um, his findings in this paper, which 
do talk a lot about how, um, you know, the, the disparities between black mothers and white mothers dying due to pregnancy related deaths and also why um, black babies tend to have lower birth weight and lower birth weight is a huge factor and if not the predominant factor in determining infant survival. And so when he's talking about how, when people are talking about why uh, BIPOC people are more affected by the coronavirus and how it's really being tailored, it's being tied to socioeconomic status and different things. I thought this quote was particularly telling. He said, people are now understanding it, but when they are misattributing, but then they are misattributing what the causes are. So people are thinking, well, the higher underlying conditions reflects the bad behavior of these populations and not really recognizing that it reflects the poor living conditions, the low economic status and the high levels of stress. So this is basically just describing that part of the reasons why we have these populations that are being more affected by COVID-19 is a, a factor of where they're located. And he really hit on this when he said, in many profound ways, place or your zip code is a powerful predictor of the factors that drive health. So diving into the stress aspect a little bit more too, um, I think a lot of people know that stress in general negatively impacts our general health. But I think something that people don't often talk about is the stress that comes from being suppressed by institutional racism. And if you live in an area where you're often discriminated against, that stress also has a very negative impact on your general health. So this is someone that a white person living in a suburb might not necessarily experience, but someone uh, uh, living in a lower economic area is subjected to every day. So you already have basically a lower footing in terms of your general health. So I think this is a good summary article on just talking about what the impact of stress does on your body function. And uh, essentially, it says based on the type, timing, and severity of the applied stimulus, stress can exert various actions on the body ranging from alterations in homeostasis, which just means your body's everyday normal function, to life-threatening effects and deaths. And so um, it says subjects exposed to stress so those that work or live in stressful environments have a higher likelihood of many disorders. So this isn't just something that people are saying. There's a lot of science behind this. And if you live in a stressful environment, you're generally going to have poorer health. So this is often attributed to why um, women of color typically have poorer birth rates and experiences, and also why black babies tend to have higher mortality rates. So uh, I thought this paper is also interesting too. This is uh, an example of like a study that's done in animals to mirror the uh, kind of the patient data that we look at. So you can look at human data to get these, um, to draw these conclusions, but you can also do studies in animals that have similar biology to us to see the effects of stress and how how that can manifest into health problems in the body. And basically this experiment, because I think we all know um, when you look at a president who starts their term, if they have a nice head of colored hair, by the end of the term, a lot of it's gray and that, that really is due to stress. So this is like an example of a mouse where they stressed it out a lot and it developed all this gray hair and they were able to track these melanocyte stem cells, which are basically your hair stem cells. And so here normally you have these little red stem cells that you can track, but in the animals that were super stressed out, these cells get depleted very quickly. And so um, this is hair in particular, but it's also thought that the stem cells and the rest of your body, stress kind of helps deplete a lot of those. So you're looking at poor maintenance of your joints, your skin, and all of your organs in general. So I think the science behind this is quite solid. Uh, so food deserts is something I wanted to bring up because this is an example of environmental racism and also kind of how you fall, once you're in a low socioeconomic status, so meaning um, your ethnicity race, the amount of money you make is a huge factor in terms of where you fall into a class system. Um, People in lower socioeconomic statuses are typically 
more likely to face a, or be in a food desert. And so I thought it was interesting. I just typed in food desert to see what the de definition returned was. And it basically, if you just type this into Google, it comes up with an urban area in which it is difficult to buy affordable or good quality fresh food. And I thought this was very fascinating because the very first time I saw the definition of food desert, it was drastically different from this. And I thought it was interesting that they included an urban area. Um, but then I started looking into this definition has been tailored because of all of the research that has come out on food deserts. So for example, this is from the United States Department of Agriculture from 2012. They actually did a full blown characteristic um, and factors of food deserts in order to help tailor this definition that we use now. And what they found is that areas with higher levels of poverty are more likely to be food deserts, meaning they can't access grocery stores where you can get like fresh produce and fresh foods and good, good choices and options. And areas with higher poverty rates are more likely to be food deserts, very dense urban areas where the higher percentage of minority population also, um, they noticed that residents in the Northeast are less likely to live far from a store. And I'll show you a map in a little bit that highlights that. But also rural areas experiencing population growth are less likely to be food deserts. So the more people you have in a rural area, typically the more access you have. And I thought this was interesting because the blue shows the food deserts and versus non-food deserts. And uh, minority versus unemployment versus housing unit without a vehicle. Um, in all cases, these, these are big factors in whether or not there will be a food desert versus a non-food desert. So all of these characteristics coming from this report ultimately helped design what this was. And when I first learned about it, I just thought it was an area that, you know, they didn't have a lot of food access or grocery stores but it's becoming more tailored to urban areas because that's what the data are showing. And then also we'll see that the prices are higher for the same goods, despite being in an area where people can't afford it. And also the quality fresh food is really a factor. It's not just having food, it's being able to go to a place and get produce versus buying a bag of Cheetos. So um, this is a more, um, I guess like scientific study that was conducted as well. And they basically did a big review of the food deserts literature. And I thought this was interesting. This is part of their introductory information. So where they provide all the background information to prep me as the reader. And I thought this was interesting that there was a lot of growth um, in the US cities between 1970 and 1988. And it's speculated that during this period, economic segregation became more prominent with more affluent households immigrating from inner cities to suburban areas, so moving from urban to rural areas. And this shift caused the median income in the inner cities to decrease and forced nearly one half of the supermarkets in three largest US cities to close. And other findings they found, I thought this was interesting. The access to supermarkets is severely limited, so they actually look at um, based on public transportation or if you have a car or if it's safe to walk home at certain hours, if you're able to access a grocery store. Um, and then one example they highlighted was in Philadelphia, if you had the higher income neighborhoods compared to the lower income neighborhoods had 156% more grocery stores. And this isn't even um, talking about the quality of the food. This is just having a grocery store in general. And also, which we know now racial and ethnic minorities suffer greatly and specifically black neighborhoods. This is all over the US. This was data collected for the entire country. Black neighborhoods have 52% fewer chain stores than white neighborhoods. And uh, the socioeconomic status is a predominant factor. And I thought this was very fascinating. Prices are higher for lower quality items. And at first I was, I couldn't wrap my head around this, like why the price would be higher compared to what I would pay in my grocery store that I can walk to down the street. But then they explained it contains more non-chain stores. So chain stores can buy things in bulk and then distribute them to different areas. And um, they can make more money in certain areas that can account for maybe a, a 
profit loss in other areas. But also if it's a non-chain store, they're less able to stock generic brand items. And they also can't, they have to um, stock smaller packaging items. So you're actually paying more money for a smaller amount of food because you're paying more for the packaging. And there was also some comments too on, on how shoplifting in um, some of these areas can also attribute to loss of profit of the grocery stores. But in general, it was by far this ability to not, stare, to not stock these generic brand items and the packaging issue. So you already have a group of people who don't have as much money to pay for these items and now they're having to pay more. Also, it's, um, this is from the USDA as well. These are the people who are most impacted by food deserts and children, which is why having school lunches for children is so important and a school being able to provide them with proper nutrition is something we really need in our systems. Also disabled adults because it's a lot of it's access, um, being able to travel to the grocery store. Single mothers because they're really busy and they've got children as well who are impacted by this as well as disabled children and then grandparents caring for grandchildren. So overall, this really, really affects kids the most. This is a map showing the percentage of places that have food deserts. And so this is why earlier I mentioned um, that in the Northeast, they said they were less likely to have access because you can see up here, it's pretty low. And then when you get to the South, it's really bad. I think a part of it is um, there wasn't anything in the literature, but just from my personal guess, I think there's a lot of areas that are very spread out, um, but also not a lot of access to cars in those areas. So you're going to have a lot of physical distance between grocery stores, but a lot of people living there who don't have cars that can travel to those grocery stores that are far apart. And so then, um, you can compare this map with the food deserts to looking at low income households or obesity, diabetes, and then car free households, which I just talked about. But essentially, a lot of this is overlapping with these factors. So you're having higher rates of obesity and diabetes because you're probably having people who are going and eating fast food for all of their meals because they can't get to a grocery store. Um, and then also, you have probably a lot of food deserts in these areas because you have people who can't drive to the store or have low income households. So this is just a quick guide for some solutions. Um, and I've seen some of these put in place when I lived in Cleveland, because I know someone who worked for um, the West Side Market and a, they actually started a new local farm that was by an abandoned housing project. And the new local farm that they started, people that they hired to, to work there, they would get a, you know, a thing of vegetables every day and free housing in the, the, pro, the housing project development. And a lot of the excess food that was produced that wasn't sold in the West Side Market, they gave to kids in the city, the inner city schools. And the guy who took us on the tour explained to me, he's like, yeah, it's pretty depressing when you go to a high school and there's 17 year olds who've never seen a real carrot before in their life. They've seen like, you know, the chopped up frozen ones that you get in like your gas station meals. But it, this is a very real thing. And that's kind of why I wanted to highlight it because it's part of this vicious cycle. If we're trying, if we're expecting our, our black youth to be able to grow up and live the American dream and, and achieve all these things, if they can't even get the proper food to stay awake in, in school all day. Um, it's just too much of a burden and it just contributes to this vicious cycle. So I think this graphic highlights that really well. So this is basically your stages of food insecurity and here's your stages of food security. And this is really the way to transition from insecurity to security. And a lot of it has to do with local change. So education in terms of children learning about proper nutrition, um, and then you have local production of this food where you can get rid of a lot of those packaging costs and make fresh food more accessible to people who are in food deserts. I think the cooking classes and even just watching cooking shows can also be really helpful for people to get them interested in these things. Um, and then, yeah, this is just a graphic highlighting 
how problematic obesity is and the food deserts by far contribute to obesity in these populations. So, and it's also really expensive. <laughs> so if we could, instead of spending this amount of money on healthcare for people, if we could find a way to divert these funds to programs like this and would also be really good for our local communities, that would be a nice solution. So um, one last thing I wanna discuss, I think we're doing okay on timing. Uh, last week during our defund the police Zoom topic, I covered um, Devante Hart and the tragic story of the Hart family to highlight how we should, um, you know, regardless of your stance on defund the police, we definitely need to shift more funding into social programs that help children. In that same episode of the podcast where I pulled all the information for that story, they also cover the murder of Stephen Lawrence. This was, uh, this happened in London. So it's not US specific, but a lot of things we could actually learn from it. Essentially an 18 year old aspiring architect who was going to college, maybe he was 17, I can't remember. Uh, he and his friend were just waiting for the bus and there was a racially charged attack from a group of white um, people about the same age as them. And if, essentially they stabbed Stephen Lawrence and he started to run away, but um, he collapsed and his friend called for 911 for the EMTs to arrive and a long amount of time passed and only the police showed up. And when the police showed up, instead of trying to provide medical treatment to Stephen, they just started asking his friend what happened, assumed that his friend was lying about the racially motivated attack and just started asking him questions like he was a suspect. And the whole time they didn't check on Steven or anything. And um, even then when the EMTs finally did arrive several minutes later after that, even they didn't really take care of him. No one provided CPR, no one took off his jacket to check. And when they picked him up, there was a giant pool of blood and that's when they realized that it was a problem. And he actually died on the way to the hospital. So not only are people of color not receiving great health care when they go to the hospital for something routine. But there's also a disparity in the treatment they receive when the emergency medical response teams arrive on the scene because there's also some pre predisposition and bias. And um, this is a picture of Stephen's parents, and this is Nelson Mandela. And uh, their criminal system was actually trying to ignore this case and just sweep it under the rug like we've seen with a lot of cases in the United States. And his parents fought very, very hard to ultimately get justice for Stephen. And part of that was because they knew Nelson Mandela and he spoke out about um, how the police just really didn't do a lot to try to address this case. And so you can listen to this podcast or follow the timeline of events here, but I just wanted to emphasize how we also have people of color who are treated improperly by our law system and also by our medical response teams. And so we'll go into some of the science of that um, based on that story. So this is an NPR article about um, highlighting emergency medical responders confronting racial bias. And within this article, they actually give the report that was published. And that report was by Jamie Kennel, who's head of the EMS programs at Oregon Health and Science University and the Oregon Institute of Technology. So some of the figures from that paper, they looked at the portion of patients who received pain medication. So this is just um, when ENTs arrived and people were complaining of pain if they gave them fentanyl or not based on their response to pain. And so there's um, all these different ethnic groups and they found that compared to white, black, Hispanic, and Asians definitely received less treatment for their pain despite giving the same reaction or answering that they were they uh, on the pain scale, giving a similar remark about the pain scale, they were less likely to be given pain medication. And also there's some disparities based on if the response call was in a rural versus an urban area. So the green is rural versus urban. So regardless of ethnicity, if the, sorry, there's sirens going on. <laughs> so uh, good timing regardless of the ethnicity or race, if the response call was in an urban area, they were more likely to be given the fentanyl. 
So um, there is some evidence of overtreatment as well, which we'll get into in the next slide. But I just wanted to highlight this um, from that particular article, uh, that report. The primary finding is evidence of EMS treatment differences in the receipt of pain medication for Black and Asian patients. Specifically, Black patients suffer the most severe treatment disparity and were 40% less likely to receive any pain medication compared to white patients when controlling for pain severity, primary impressions, gender, anatomical location of the complaint, age, and the insurance status of the patient. So they really did check all their boxes when looking at different factors. So um, in terms of the over-providing medication by medical response teams, I feel like a lot of people have probably heard the story about Elijah McLean. This was an autistic man who was wearing a hoodie and pants and police, just to, to summarize all of it, police put him in a chokehold. He didn't do anything, but since he was acting strangely, um, if you attended the meeting, the last Zoom meeting, this is an example where I said if we had social workers who would arrive with police, that social worker probably would have been able to de-escalate the situation. But the police's response was to put him in a similar chokehold um, as George Floyd, and that combined with giving him a very, very high dose of ketamine to sedate him is um, ultimately what probably led to the heart attack and the, co the coma that killed this young man. So he was only 23. And uh, he was a very sweet person. And again, it's, it's just a product of um, some really bad mishandling by police conduct. But looking at the ketamine aspect of this, this is a Star Tribune article. So this isn't an academic article, but it, I did read through it and it looks very credible. There's a lot of, um, this is Hennepin, um, Hennepin Healthcare is located in, um, Minnesota, Minneapolis, and there's a lot of reports of patients who have been forcibly enrolled in this ketamine study that police and EMTs were conducting without um, basically the patient's permission. And so effectively, um, a lot of th these are just testimonials from these patients about how they were sedated by ketamine and would basically wake up in the hospital and had no idea what happened. And there was no reason for the EMTs or the police to have them sedated. And so this article I thought was really excellent too. This highlights how females and minority racial ethnic groups remain upper, underrepresented in emerg emergency medical services. So the predominant person who is in an EMS or EMT job is a white male. And they think a big part of similar to what we talked about with the infant mortality rates. If you have more diversity in the workforce, you have these people who are more empathetic and understanding of people in different situations. And I think if we can increase the diversity uh, in the teams of these emergency medical response teams, that can help alleviate a lot of the issues that we see. But also um, not letting people, like not letting cops and EMTs partner to do illegal studies would be great too. So this is something I just kind of wanted to discuss briefly uh, as a close, because I really do think that we're seeing a lot of these disparities in healthcare just on a, you know, just for common people, but also it's really important as we're seeing all of these professional athletes protest that it's not, I don't agree with the comments where people say that they should just shut up and play because professional athletes basically give their bodies for their job. And especially college athletes, a lot of those college athletes, there's people in higher positions profiting off of their bodies, essentially. Yeah, they're getting a free education in, in, in exchange. But if you talk to anyone who, who um, has actually been uh, played college sports on a scholarship, especially football on a scholarship, the education is not the focus. And I think it's important to know um, ESPN has an article where they do an ethnic breakdown and the NBA and NFL are like, this is, uh, this corresponds to black or African American. And then these are your other ethnicities. And I think we all know just from watching sports that NBA and NFL the vast majority of players are black or African American. And then you look at other sports like Major League Baseball or hockey, 
that are predominantly white, but how the players are treated differently. And you look at where the protests are stemming from, there is a high correlation between black athletes being, their bodies being profited off of by white men. And then subsequently, when you look at the research, there are treat that these uh, professional athletes are not only because there's more black people who play these professional sports, particularly higher contact sports, and are more subject to lifelong health problems, that even when they're going to the hospital, they're, rep they're reporting discrimination by just being treated in the hospital, but also um, they, they report more pain, physical impairment, mood disorders, and cognitive problems than white peers. And one of the big findings of this research was that factors such as discrimination prior to, during, or following a player's time in the NFL could account for the disparities. Systemic and structural racism has been linked with worse mental and physical health and higher mortality. Additionally, past research indicates that non-whites are more likely to receive lower quality health care than whites. So a lot of the stuff that we talked about earlier. So you factor in the, fa the idea that their physical health is literally their job. And then also on top of it, they're facing all of these racial disparities just because they're a person that is black. So I think it's something interesting to think about, especially with all of the drama around whether college football should be happening right now. You have to remember that a big chunk of those college athletes are black people who is a group that is also being disproportionately killed by COVID-19. So trying to force them to participate in an activity that's already profit profiting off of their health, which they already have a predisposition to, in favor of a dis and, and by ignoring a disease that is also killing people like them at a higher rate is really unfair. And I'm just, it's actually very exciting, I think, to see these athletes taking a stand. And this concept hopefully will come to light and is something that more people can understand when they're watching these sports. That it's not just entertainment, these are also people who um, are, are disproportionately affected in big ways. So some additional resources I just wanted to provide. Uh, the NPR shortwave podcast in general is very excellent. They also do some really cool uh, segments on what it's like to be an academic when you're black and you're recruited basically for a diversity checkbox. But then once you get there, there's a lack of resources to actually protect you and embrace your, your diversity. And there's also another one that focuses on the Mission District in San Francisco and how they held a study to kind of tackle the racial disparities for the Hispanic community that was being hit very hard by COVID-19. So that study was really interesting too. Um, the COVID racial data tracker, I've shared this before. This, is, this website I think is the best one in terms of being able to track the number of cases in your state, but they also have a separate function where you can look at how race is being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Also, the, there's a Facebook page for Real Action Community Engagement, which is a group my uncle has started with, um, I'm helping out with it, but a couple of his friends from the Maslin Canton area, if you're in Ohio, um, they're, they're trying to get some really, really cool content that we're gonna be putting out to engage in these topics around race, but also provide ways to increase voter transparency and really uh, help the youth feel more engaged in the, the um, issues that surround our communities. So um, you can look for that on Facebook. We'll be posting a lot of content, including recordings of presentations like this on there. Also, I have an anti-racist initiatives Google Doc. If anyone's interested, you can email me or contact me through Facebook and I will send that to you. It's the Harvard Medical School held a panel and they put this Google Doc together. Also, I highly recommend if you have a Netflix account, watch the 13th to understand basically how our government was able to put people of color in these socioeconomic binds um, with mass incarceration, but also redlining certain districts so that they're the ones who are suffering from food deserts and this recurring cycle of behavior that keeps them oppressed. Um, when They See Us is also a really good way to kind of understand how our 
um, legal system also puts people of color in a dis in disposition. And I think this unbelievable is a really excellent case study in seeing how women from different socioeconomic backgrounds can be treated poorly for being victims of the same crime. This 30 for 30 episode on Benji Wilson is also really excellent. So this also kind of piggybacks on um, the story about Stephen Lawrence, about how the medical response, if it had been proper, could have saved his life, but instead we lost a potential basketball legend over it. This Dear Black Athlete series, also done by ASPN, is really excellent in terms of highlighting the Black experience as a professional athlete. So I always do my takeaways for these presentations. Um, racism is a public health crisis. If you haven't, if you don't believe that after this presentation, um, I guess we could talk more about it. I can give you more papers, but really it, there's a lot of problems that black people have to experience because of racism being pervasive in our public health system, but also that affects all of us in general. Um, also, BIPOC are extremely disadvantaged in our current healthcare system, even when blatant racism isn't present. So all of those facts and um, instances I provided earlier about implicit bias, that seems to be the predominant factor in terms of Black people receiving disproportionate health care. Also, unconscious bias can occur simply because you don't understand other people's backgrounds. And I think that's um, empathy is really key. I think I say that almost every presentation I give, but just learning about other people's backgrounds and what kind of areas they live in and what kind of situations they go through can just make you a better person in general. But also I think it would help a lot of our physicians be better care providers. Combat food deserts in your area. So support local businesses, support um, farmers markets, and also try to, you know, you can do things like try to start a farmer's market in your area if you live in a food desert. Also vote for representatives that will proactively support and fund the National Institutes of Health so you can have researchers continuing to do this kind of research, but also provide it to you in the form of free research articles that you can access online. And also vote for representatives that advocate for social services, because a lot of this could be resolved if we've we you know, invested more in the success of our communities and our, our youth. Also, I think this is, I heard, I tried to find this exact quote because I heard it similar from someone before and I could not find it, but I really think this is important to emphasize that black people do not succeed because they succeed despite. And I think evaluating the discrimination they undergo on a daily basis, the fact that they're more susceptible to low socioeconomic status, more susceptible to food deserts, and all these pervasive health problems, it, it really does say something about their resilience. And for people who are able to get out of that, it's really, really impressive. And it's not because they did something, they succeeded despite all of the obstacles that were put in their way. So this is a cool, this is like the one last thing I just wanted to highlight that all, in all of my research, I've really found that between children being more susceptible to things because of where they live and your geographic location and mass incarceration being in effect, um, racism really is just a vicious cycle. And this is actually a, a Canadian study on homeless women in one particular region but they noticed that there was a vicious cycle of these women not being able to find homes because of poverty and social exclusion, inability to find and maintain housing, ineffective services, and that ultimately led to unresolved trauma or health problems. And I think you could really just relabel this and say um, people of color and it, and it also applies. So I think the solution is we really need to break the chain in one place and ultimately to ultimately disrupt this cycle, but where exactly that break is um, remains to be seen. So I just wanted to really say thank you. I figured I put this because I thought Jared would think it was funny because I did it earlier for Food Desert. But um, a lot of you know Jared, he gave a great presentation um, when we did a segment on, um, oh my gosh, I don't even remember, but it was COVID related. I've done so many of these, sorry. <laughs> And he also recruited his friend, Jared Shackner. I'm not 100% sure if I'm saying that right, 
but Jared Shackner sent me this incredible list of a lot of the research I've covered for you today, as well as articles that cover those academic publications, but are by like journalists and reporters, they're, they're a little bit more reader friendly. So if any of you are interested in more of those, you can email me and I will forward Jared's email to you. And Jared um, knows, Jared Roseman, so my Jared, knows this other Jared, and that he was able to connect me with him to get all these incredible resources. So I just wanted to say thank you to Team Jared for all of this. And I'll just close um, with this quote, no amount of money can replace the value of your health without it, who are you? And <laughs> this is my quote, she's not, um, this is my grandma, she's 92 years old and she can touch her toes. So she's not a scientist, but I would say she, she knows a good amount about taking care of yourself and, and how important it is to be healthy. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks again for all of you for attending and we'll go ahead and open it for discussion.